in Summer Study, which was also published in NEGM shortly after its presentation at SABCS. So this particular study looks into the utility of axillary surgery when compared to axillary lymph node biopsy in early stage breast cancer. Even though our surgery colleagues face this question day in, day out, as a medical oncologist, it is still important for us to appreciate this landscape as well. Laura, can you touch on this study design and its findings? Sure, of course. So um, this was a really interesting study presented last week at San Antonio. Um, and the key question is, does every patient need a sentinel lymph node biopsy? And so this trial um, was a large, um, over 5,000 patients, randomized non-inferiority study that compared the omission of sentinel lymph node biopsy versus the use of sentinel lymph node biopsy to evaluate whether omitting a axillary surgery compromised invasive disease-free survival. And so as mentioned, very large study, um, patients had to have small tumors, so they had to be T1 or T2 and clinically node negative. Um, and patients were enrolled to either receive the sentinel lymph node biopsy or not, um, with the primary endpoint being invasive disease-free survival. And at a median follow-up of 6.1 years, um, what they saw was that there was no statistically significant difference, a 91.7% um, invasive disease-free survival in patients who received the sentinel lymph node biopsy versus 91.9% in patients who did not. And there was also no difference in overall survival, 96.9% um, with sentinel lymph node biopsy, 982 without. Um, and importantly, they also um, noted in the presentation and the publication that patients who skipped axillary surgery reported fewer complications, lower rates of lymphedema, um, better quality of life. So all kind of important um, you know, clinical um, features for our patients that are kind of making this decision. Um, they did see, however, the axillary recurrence was slightly higher in the non-surgery group, about 1%, um, versus in the patients who received the sentinel lymph node biopsy, 0.3%. Um, and they did kind of comment that these were patients who were undergoing um, breast conserving surgery, so they were getting radiation anyway. And so there was some thought that the radiation to the breast provided at least some incidental coverage to the axilla, which was um, kind of a, a point that was made as well. So I think, you know, what do we do with this data and kind of how do we interpret this data in the current landscape? I think this, this trial enrolled a very specific patient population. I think they were patients who are 50 years and older who had a lower risk um, you know, profile, smaller tumors, less than two centimeters, grade one or grade two. So I think this is the population where you can consider you know, applying this data. I think some of the caveats, however, I think that six year follow-up is pretty good. However, we know that for these smaller low grade tumors, these tumors can recur out to 20 years. So we really do need longer follow-up to know if this omission of sentinel lymph node biopsy you know, the IDFS translates to a, a you know, longer IDFS benefit with longer follow-up as well. I think the other thing that I thought when I was hearing this data at San Antonio is, you know, now we have the option to use adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitors in patients who are node positive. And so um, if a patient foregoes a sentinel lymph node biopsy and they might have actually had a positive sentinel lymph node, um, you know, are we missing an opportunity to consider treating that patient with, you know, adjuvant ribocyclib or adjuvant abemocyclib? Um, I was digging through the New England Journal, about 14% of patients where they um, did do the sentinel lymph node biopsy in this trial actually had a positive sentinel lymph node. So, you, you know, about that rate, you know, 10 to 15% um, who we thought were clinically node negative, in fact, were positive. And that would be a patient that I would, you know, certainly discuss, you know, with the approval of ribocyclib now for even small um, tumors, as long as they're node positive, it is a consideration. And so um, I think that kind of changes how I look at this data as well a bit. Um, but nonetheless, I do think it, um, it's kind of great to have this option for some lower risk patients to consider the omission. Um, I think just some caveats on the length of follow-up and the, how it impacts adjuvant medical therapy um, that should also be discussed with our patients before we kind of consider adopting this data. It's such a fine balance to sort of manage the quality of life aspects, but of course not compromising any of the future outcomes. And as you stated, uh, this was something that was done prior to the era of CDK4-6 inhibitors, and now with ribocyclin being utilized in even node negative uh, settings as well. So this definitely changes some of that. And of course, the longer term data will rather dictate where we are moving on. Laura, any portion, like what portion of these patients were rather hormone receptor positive, HER2 positive? 
and triple negative. And would you think this sort of segment applies to early breast cancer throughout? Yeah, really good point. So these were all hormone receptor positive HER2 negative patients. And so I think, um, you know, I would be hesitant to adopt this across subtypes because it has, wasn't how it was studied here. Um, and I think even more important for the HER2 positive and triple negative subtypes to know their nodal status because that would dictate their, their therapy choices as well. So um, would be cautious there.